Hey there, this is Phil Vischer, the creator of VeggieTales and What's in the Bible. I am here with my good friend John Walton. I'm a big fan of science, and I've loved reading some of John's stuff, and so I invited him to sit down and have a conversation. So, John, thanks for coming. It's great to be here. So I've read your book, The Lost World of Genesis 1, uh, and uh, you've been talking about it in this DVD and in your classes, and uh, we wanted to get in a little bit deeper, like the concept of context. You talk about high and low context. That's a little fuzzy to me. Can you dig into that a little bit more? Sure. Uh, that's where I'm trying to understand sort of how communication takes place. Because if we're going to try to, to benefit from the communication of Scripture, then we have to know how, how that works. Um, we could okay. use an example of, of high context uh, in our own culture. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, topics and issues uh, that we talk about where we have kind of a specialized language that we all know what it means. Uh, for take example. for example. Sure. Um, daylight savings time. Yes. Okay, daylight savings time. What is going on? Well, we just use that phrase and we figure everybody knows what we're talking about. You know, if somebody came from another culture who, where they didn't use daylight savings time and were trying to learn English and things like that, they'd say, okay, I know the word daylight and I know the word savings and I know the word time, but what in the world are you talking about? Right. And right. then if, if we tried to explain it, we'd find ourselves in trouble. Well, it's, it's when we change time. You what? Oh, yeah, well, well it's, we all agree to it. Can you do that? You know, th right. There's all kinds of right. questions we would have about exactly how, what does this mean? And it's a, it's a cultural concept that's, okay. that's behind that phrase. So would slang be another example where we're writing or speaking with slang and someone sure. else has no idea what that means? Slang would be an example. Even in texting, we, we use a high oh. context uh, situation where we assume that all of our shortcuts and abbreviations people are going to understand. So we say the Bible has authority. Um, but then you're telling me that maybe some of the things that it was saying to the Israelites that they understood about their world or the way they saw the world or the way they believed the world was set up were actually incorrect. Here's where we get the difference between the kind of hooks you hang communication on and the communication itself. There are things we use to frame our communication, and they're the things that we really want to say. And in that situation, we have a case where uh, God is going to communicate to the Israelites using a framework uh, of, of things that are familiar to them. Because communication has to happen okay. in terms of the familiar. So he's going to use what's familiar to them to talk about the things that are important to him. Gotcha. And so what we want to really learn is not what it was, was literal to the Israelites, but what was true to God. Uh, it's not necessarily a sense of literal. Okay. It's a matter of just the... You don't like the word literal, do you? Well, you know, different people understand it different ways. <laughs> and so you always have to be, be careful with terms that can take on a variety of meanings. You know, these chameleon right. terms uh, that can sneak in. Right. So, uh, so in that sense, you know, we want to take the text seriously. Uh, but what we want to take seriously is what it is that the text is seeking to communicate with its authority. Right, fantastic. Okay, uh, cosmic geography. You're talking about cosmic geography and what cosmic geography the, the Israelites had and, and what God showed them, and I don't even know what that means. What is cosmic geography? Cosmic geography is the, how we understand the shape of the world around us. Uh, so our cosmic geography includes a globe, it includes a number of identified continents and mm -hmm. the oceans, it includes our understanding of the way the world is, the way the earth is situated in the solar system uh, with reference to the planets and the sun and the moon, uh, the stars okay. being far away, all of that is our cosmic geography. So Mars geography. is part of our cosmic geography, it is indeed. Mm -hmm. the galaxies that we're aware of, everything we know and how it's right. set up and how it works. And all of that is, is pretty instinctive to us because we've learned it. Right. We've learned it through the culture. We've learned it through our early education experiences. And so we have this cosmic geography, which is representative of, of where our culture stands mm -hmm. in understanding the world around us. Okay. And what does that have to do with Israel? Well, they don't have the same cosmic geography as we do. How do we know? Uh, we know that because we have texts in the Bible itself which talks about their cosmic geography. We have texts from the ancient world in which Israel was, was of which Israel was a part, and we have that cosmic geography. And so we have a, quite a bit of literature, uh, okay. both in the Bible and out, that tells us so about their cosmic geography. So when God inspires someone to write something in the Bible, 
wh whose cosmic geography does God have in mind? Well, see, that's exactly the question. Lots of times modern readers will look at it and say, oh, well, since the Bible is true, it must speak to the cosmic geography that I believe is true. Right. And so we'll try to find uh, maybe echoes or indicators, read between the lines, try to find mm -hmm. kind of what we believe to be a true cosmic geography. Uh, but of course the fact is uh, all issues of science, cosmic geography included, are, are in flux right. and things right. change. And so even our sense of what the cosmic geography is may not be correct. Well, there, there, there may not be a Mars. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> okay, so what about genres of scripture? When we look at, is it poetry? Is it history? Is it, you know, is it revelation, apocalyptic stuff? When we look at Genesis 1 um, and Genesis 2, you know, we're, we're often asking, okay, is this history? Well, the minute we start using labels like that, uh, it's not just an innocent label that's just sitting there waiting to be defined. It's a label that we already have definitions for, and lots of times those definitions are already tied into our cultural ways of viewing things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, use a, we use a term like uh, history. Of course, history refers to events. Uh, literature that's writing history uh, could be called historiography if you want to get fancy and technical mm -hmm. with it. Um, I like fancy yeah, words. Yeah, you like that, yeah. So the, the idea of um, uh, a certain genre where you record events, well, now you have to ask the question, is really recording events the major focus? Is that what's going on, or is something right. else happening? Uh, to call something um, history would have one set of assumptions, some of them modern, um, perhaps some of them not, but they would also have, uh, you would also talk about cosmology. Uh, what's, what's that carry along mm -hmm. with it? Uh, how would that be different? Can cosmology be history? Can history be cosmology? We have a lot of Is there a better terms. term for Genesis 1? Well, if, if we talk about what the text is intending to do and what its focus is, we would have to include cosmology as part of it because it wants to understand the cosmos. Right. And so they're going to use that kind of uh, approach and understanding. That doesn't mean it's any less historical. It just It's a difference of how you word what's going on. Basically, Genesis, uh, the, the author of Genesis, has tried to communicate some of the deepest truths that, that he knows and that he wants to reveal as mm -hmm. God has given it to him. And so what's the best vehicle for that truth? Uh, the choice of a best vehicle is going to be dependent on what conventions best suit. Let me give you an example. Okay. Um, if we looked at a, a painting, Picasso's painting of right. uh, one of his models, Dora Maar, Okay, uh, yes, crazy stuff. Yeah, we'd, we'd look at that painting and we'd say, wow, I mean, that's just all over the place. Uh, wh what's She's got seven you know, eyeballs what, yeah, and what? four sides of her head visible yeah, at once. Exactly, what, what was he thinking? Um, now, we could also look at a photograph of Dora Maar and we'd say, okay, that makes more sense to me. But mm -hmm. see, that has to do with conventions mm -hmm. that, that we're using and that we prefer. Uh, sometimes we come to a Genesis text and we want something more like a photograph whereas the author might be given as something more like a Picasso. Uh, you could look at the Picasso, and you could look at the photograph and say, I can't get there from here. I can't, I could never take that painting and reproduce the photograph. Right, right. And sometimes that's how it is in literature as well. Wow. You can't so necessarily reproduce what you think would be most useful to you. Genesis 1 is abstract art. I wouldn't call it a Picasso. 